Welcome back to another episode from the Optimal Body Podcast. I'm Dr. Dom. I'm Dr. Jen. And today we're going to be talking about piriformis syndrome or that pain in the butt. Why might it be happening? But really, what can you do about it? All right, so I'm excited to talk about what to do about piriformis syndrome because really what people want to know is how can I address this? How can I build up the resilience and strengthen that area and feel less pain. But before we jump into that, please consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell because we have so many of these PT pearls and other videos that Jen puts out on pain disorders, movement that you can do to help feel the strongest and most mobile in your body. And comment below, do you have piriformis syndrome? Have you experienced this? Do you have any specific questions you want us to address? Let us know down here pain in the booty. <laughs> now we've actually done a podcast on this before. So we explain and kind of break down exactly what it is, the anatomy that goes into it and all of those things. And I actually hate when we really narrow our scope of focus on one tiny little muscle and say, this is the issue because, well, what led to that being the issue? Yeah. What's the overall issue, right? The root cause here. Yeah. And usually it's not just one muscle. Like, okay, well, why did those glutes in that area feel the need to like kick on and feel the need to compress and tighten? And will just smashing into something really help to relieve that? Well, maybe in the moment it can help to relieve some tension and pressure, but then if it goes back into it or if you need that tension release, that foam rolling or that manual technique, you know, into your glutes every single time, well, then are we actually getting to the issue? Probably not. I mean, we'd like to name all these diagnoses and disorders after specific muscles after specific nerves and then just attack that muscle or nerve like that's gonna solve the problem but in reality the piriformis or the sciatic nerve is being irritated because of some other lack or some other deficiency in our body and we just had a guest on our podcast that brought up this great analogy of you know a cup of water our cup should normally start maybe a quarter full in the day and that three quarters that is still empty you know represents all of the stressors that we can take on before the water starts pouring out and we start feeling pain or we start Mm -hmm. feeling symptoms once we have irritated this area then piriformis sciatic area our cup is starting 50 percent full 75 percent full and we have a lot less space of stimuli or stressors that we can put into that cup before we start feeling symptoms Mm -hmm. so what else can we do in our life to empty that cup you know, mm-hmm. there's there's so many things that whether we're focusing on a little bit better sleep, whether we're focusing on what we put into our body as far as what we eat, drinking more water and staring, staying hydrated, getting electrolytes in, all these different things that we can do to just empty that cup a little bit more and give ourselves a little bit more of a buffer before we even start looking at our movement. But then when we do start looking at our movement, I think something that's really crucial and important when it comes to this cup analogy is if we're always doing the same movement over and over again, and we're not providing a balance of movement, well, then we're going to overflow in one area. If I'm only strength training, which is great, or if I'm only running, like all these things are great, right? If you're but, only doing yoga, if you're only yes, doing CrossFit. Yes. Like, well, then we're missing another aspect, right? If I'm only stretching, I'm missing strengthening. If I'm only strengthening, I'm missing some down regulation and some mobility work. Like, how do we get both and in in the picture so that we're not, we're kind of not allowing that cup to overfill just in one area. We're going to just kind of go over all sorts of things you can do to kind of assess. And as you're assessing, address mobility and strength and lumbopelvic interactions Mm -hmm. between our low back and our hips and pelvis and how all of that can kind of play into us maybe overstressing the piriformis or that gluteal area or maybe resulting in that wanting to activate and hold more tension. A great place to start is looking at some lower extremity or leg nerve flosses Mm -hmm. because there's a few different ways that you can do that and that's going to help you assess like okay do i have a lot of tension in my nerves and a great way to do that is just start by laying on your back have one leg kind of straight laying flat on the ground holding underneath the other leg and as you extend your knee keep those toes kind of tucked and pointed back down towards your body so you're going to straighten the knee point the toes towards your body and then let off and what that's going to do is kind of put a stretch 
of sorts through that sciatic nerve yeah, tensioning the nerve. tensioning through that sciatic nerve and help you see like if you feel that significant in one leg and maybe that's the side you have more of those piriformis sy symptoms on then try the other leg do you feel it a little bit less okay that's telling you something mm -hmm. this sciatic nerve is a little bit hot it's got a little more tension through it and so doing a few of those flosses every once in a while throughout the day could help to just bring more awareness to that nerve or even just starting with it in the morning and anytime we're, we're addressing the nerve we don't want to be really aggressive with it so if pulling your toe back towards you is just like really like oh my gosh that elicited a lot of symptoms or that that felt a lot through my leg then we definitely want to start backing off by even just not pulling the toe back and pulling the just pointing the toe up toward the ceiling you know so we have different levels of kind of stressing that nerve and we just want to make sure that we're not over tensioning over yeah. stretching over doing it and that's also why I don't like the hamstring stretch when you get the strap and you put it on your foot and you pull the foot back towards you or you're sitting on the ground and you have to pull your toes back towards you that's a nerve stretch we're getting we're tensioning the nerve and then we're asking to hold in that position that's a lot of tension for a nerve so I don't like doing that I think more of an active movement of that leg and kind of assessing how far back that foot can go is really important to just start to build that mobility through the nerves or if you start to kick your knee straight and you have your toes pointed towards you try kind of pointing them towards you and inward so you're you're going a little more towards the big toe or then going out towards the pinky toe or then point your toe and then you know point your toe, toe towards the ceiling and then kind of angle it towards that big toe again that can even more so tell you okay where is this tension being held as it goes down the leg is one of those you know feeling a lot more intense than the other that can maybe help you understand where to target that nerve tensioning or that nerve floss activity and then kind of like you were mentioning earlier we want to pay attention to the pelvis and the rib cage mm -hmm. and our just core stability because that's a great way that we can again help find central stability so we're not feeling like we need to find stiffness or you know extra tension in that piriformis or gluteal region something we talk about all the time you could do this listening right now is just taking your hand wrapping it around that low rib cage giving it a little tiny bit of a squeeze and then as you take a breath in a nice slow breath in from your nose you want to feel that pressure going into your hands so now it's not just a belly breath it's definitely we don't want to vertical chest breath we just want this nice little expansion from the sides and then do a long slow breath out and what you'll notice on that breath out hopefully is that the rib cage starts to drop and as you breathe all that air out you're going to compress and kind of wrap around into the ribs and into um, that core and that's where we start to build that good deep core pressure not rounding not sucking the belly in, not doing anything crazy but we're just using the breath to start to guide what's happening from our diaphragm down to our hips and that's going to help to kind of compress into this inner core and get us more aligned and stacked in a more ideal position from where we want to then move the extremities from. Say we get on all fours in kind of this quadruped position on your hands and knees and then we want to try doing some of this breath work while we're even doing simple pelvic tilts so almost like you're doing a cat cow or a cat camel exercise and as you inhale Try to feel that expansion and then as you exhale try to feel that rib cage drop down and then start to coordinate that with a little bit more of a, of a pelvic tilt so on the inhale maybe you're going into a little bit more of an anterior tilt and then on an exhale you're going into a posterior pelvic tilt even if you hold more of like a bird dog where your opposite arm opposite leg is out and we, we're not trying to move at all we're not trying to rotate we're not trying to let our back drop but we're getting those good big expansive breaths from that rib cage to that to that pelvic floor you know that's going to really help to drive in that that central core stability that we're kind of talking about Lee, the goal is to tolerate more load because through life we move we bend we walk we lift we do things so that has to be like we have to be active in working toward how are we going to load into our hip better now when's the last time you've checked or assessed your hip rotation mm -hmm. <laughs> whether that be internal or external rotation i mean one that we'd love to talk about is the 90 90 where you're kind of sitting with you know one leg in front of you one leg kind of behind or out to the side that back leg is going into internal rotation front legs going into external rotation but even if you wanted to just actively check this on your back before you get into that position lay on your back hold underneath one of your legs and try to just actively almost windshield wiper that leg out to the side to go into internal rotation i do not 
have much internal rotation <laughs> on either side and then do the same into external rotation by bringing that foot in um, my external rotation is quite a bit better but then to get into a passive stretch that you can then go into more of an activation of internal and external rotators get into that 90 90 lean forward into that front leg keeping the chest nice and tall sit there for a breath or two and then kind of push into that front leg where you're pushing out of that and then you lean back into that back leg to get more of a passive internal rotation stretch breathe into that for a, a you know a breath or two and then lean forward and lift that back ankle off the ground while keeping that knee down. That's gonna really help you start to assess and then work on both internal and external rotation. Or maybe we're lacking internal range of motion. And a very functional way to find more internal range of motion is through standing. And one of my favorite ways is um, hip airplanes. And you could definitely use support when you're first starting hip airplanes. But just to kind of break it down and explain it, you're kind of going into like a single leg deadlift position where your knees is is bent a little bit so that it has some support and you can hang on to something in front of you and what you do is you let that hip drop in so the hip that's floating in the air you let it drop toward the inside of your thigh and then you get this big stretch of your glute and what we're doing is we're creating more internal rotation from how we're moving that pelvis on that femur and then we rotate out the opposite way and we're creating more external rotation as we move that pelvis on that femur in the opposite direction. Our protocol for addressing something like a piriformis syndrome, yes, it might start off more basic and controlled, but it should go into loading. Load, load, load is our goal here anytime we're feeling some kind of pain within the body, especially this. Rather than trying to blame the piriformis and attacking that one specific area, how do we focus a little bit more broadly on all the things that we can control to offload that area, make that area feel more strong, able, and resilient so that we can get back to the functional things in life that help us feel purposeful and meaningful and happy in our everyday, day-to-day -day activities. Thanks so much for joining us on another podcast. I hope you enjoyed that and learned a ton. If you have more questions, please drop them below. What exercises kind of surprised you as well? What exercises are you going to try because you either have piriformis syndrome or you want to prevent it? Let us know below and don't forget to subscribe.